Thank you for joining me today. We'll have another session in our SQL base camps before Trino Summit series. Um, I can't believe it. Summit is in two weeks, Martin. We have a lot of preparation still to do, but it's going to be a great event, right? Yeah, it's going to be amazing, like, like, like always. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't even know some of the sessions that are coming. It's going to be really cool. Like, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It should be very exciting to see people uh, talk about their usage of Trino. But today we are doing a SQL base camp before Trino Summit. Uh, last time I had Dane join me as my victim and we talked about things he wasn't prepared for. And today my victim is Martin, uh, one of the co-founders of Trino and all around SQL expert in Trino and beyond, obviously. And he's also a co-author on Trino the Definitive Guide with me. So, which by the way, we got uh hard copies of the japanese edition now which is really amazing to see as well thank you to you for that so last time we talked about moving supplies so we talked about sort of the basics of what a data lake house is and how you get stuff in there and some of the things about maintenance and we explained all the concepts today we're gonna sort of under the working title getting ready to summit talk about a whole bunch of things in like a variety of aspects that are related but also apply in terms of your SQL skills to other things with Trino and just stuff that we didn't talk about in prior training classes and that are also important. So um, it's going to be exciting. We'll have a bit of this introduction now, then we'll do the training. And also, also for all of those that are joining us live, thank you so much for jumping in. We would love to get your questions. Live will pay attention and as in the background also and also will be able to maybe answer some questions or feed them towards us and we'll try to answer them now or also a little bit in the QA session after this. So don't be afraid, ask any time. Uh, there's nothing to follow along in terms of like as a training class, so to speak. So just pay attention and have some fun. Um, so we're gonna jump to this slide deck here, getting ready to summit. This is part of the Trino presentations repository that's available online. Um, we'll share the link after again. Um, which has a whole bunch of presentations, uh, introductions to Trino and more, even a Trino trivia, which is kind of fun if you want to run a Trino party <laughs> and ask some questions to the audience. Uh, we've done that at the summit in the past, but today we're going to reach uh, new SQL skill heights in a number of different topics. So we'll talk a little bit about dealing with change, talk a few more little tips about data maintenance in a lake house, uh, sort of building a little bit on top and discussing a bit more what I talked with Dane last time about, because some of those things I learned new again just since then. And um, there's always some traps for everyone built into the SQL syntax. And um, it's always worth talking about that. Then we're gonna talk about uh, some news out of the JSON support in Trino, which is already awesome. And me and Martin did a training session around this in the past. But what we never talked about is those other structural data types, map, array, and row. And there's some really cool stuff in there. We'll then do a bit of a tour around what window functions are and a little bit about match make recognize maybe. And then we might even glimpse at views because everyone seems to be talking about views. Um, and there's a lot of confusion whenever I talk to people about views, they get confused about what it is, what it shows up and like how it works. Um, Sounds good as an agenda, Martin. Any special topics that you prefer and love the most about this? Yeah, no, just, just, just go with it. Let's roll with it. All right, let's do that. So the first one is um, sort of talk, let's chat a bit about sort of what got us to to the new lake houses. And that was the, the whole aspect of dealing with change. Um, I think it's safe to say that one of the core issues of the old data lakes built on Hive was that dealing with change was very difficult, right? Like, I'm sure you have some war stories around that, Martin. <laughs> yeah, especially when, uh, I mean, you have like, I mean, a data, data lake affords you to have a lot of data, especially with object storage, uh, cloud and so on. So uh, you end up with massive, massive data stores. And if you may have a table that has petabytes worth of data for a large organization. And if you wanna make changes to it, then there are certain things you can and cannot do easily. Like for example, I don't know, let's say you, you have a you have a column that has um, I don't know numbers in it, and then you realize, oh, I actually need to put strings as well in it. 
and and you want to change the type well you can't just go and change it on, on all your data because it might it might involve rewriting your entire table which could be super super expensive to do so you have to deal with those those types of problems yeah so as you mentioned time and cost are core issues right like it's e it's easy if you have a little postgres database and a it does it, it supports those kind of changes and b update times are nothing and the costs are nothing but if it's like a massive data warehouse and like the even just the runtime of these queries goes into the days and storage gets taxed everywhere it, it gets very difficult so what what happened then in the past like did people just not change the data or like did they have to create new tables or they just go oh, i give up <laughs> no there's, there's some changes you can do like for example you can add columns safely and you don't need to go and rewrite existing files because the the, some of the data format, the table formats are designed to support um, that type of evolution. For example, if you have a new column in the table definition and a, and a file, a parquet file doesn't have that that column, the engine will interpret that as being an empty column. So that type of, of change is um, reasonable to do. There are other changes, like for example, if let's say you have um, integers in in one column and then you decide you you realize you need to make the the type wider you need to be able to have um uh big ends, uh because yeah, your yeah. number is larger than what fits in an integer uh then you can you can go and change the definition and any existing file that may have data encoded as an integer underneath uh will still be readable by the engine and then the engine will do the the, the conversion automatically so so there are the, these type of conversions where uh, if the existing data can be reinterpreted as the new types uh, using the uh, like well-known and understood uh, conversion rules, then the engine can, uh, it's actually the connector that does it under the covers, but connector can, can do it and present it to, to Trino uh, using the new, the new schema. So that's a, a way to evolve your, your data over time. Uh, it extends to, um, more complex types. So, for example, if you have if you have a nested data, let's say you have a row uh, type that has you know three fields, and then you decide to add another field in that row type, uh, the engine, the connectors, and the engine can also do it. And this varies on a per connector basis. Some connectors are more powerful than others, um, but but in general, that's that's kind of the strategy. Yeah, so that's one of the things that like it's known as like well I'll show uh, I'll show the docs later. Um, this is like in the Hive connector we have the Hive schema evolution. There's a, a whole bunch of rules in terms of like upcasts and coercions and stuff like that that are happening for this data. So that's really cool. But that kind of like still was limited, right? And that then led to the creation of the iceberg connector and or, like the iceberg format that they the and like to uh, to cover for like more excessive changes, right? Like where you have to completely change the structure right right with, with iceberg and uh, i mean I, I forget the exact details but um with hive with hive when you partition your data you have to pretty much choose ahead of time where you're going to partition on uh let's say if you want to partition on on date uh, you, mm. you you said that up, up front and then that's it with uh with iceberg you can evolve your partitioning scheme and i don't recall the the rules for that but there's there are way, ways to deal with uh evolving the the partition scheme over time for example if you decide that oh it's not actually by date i need to partition i need to partition further by by um sorry not by uh, yeah by day by, by hour for example so you can mm -hmm. you can level partitioning uh after the fact and 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 the iceberg iceberg format will deal with it and of yeah. course the connectors and, and the engine will be able to understand it yeah, that's obviously important. And that's one of those things that's always surprising is like you need to understand this kind of to some degree because it highly in like how a table is partitioned highly impacts the speed of your queries, right? And so it has to be partitioned sort of in the right way for your typical payload, obviously, <laughs> like in terms of what right. queries are. Yeah, partition is is the it's almost one of those uh, magic uh magic tricks that allows you, if you have a massive table, is the thing that allows you to, when you run a query, prune out the, uh, in, in most cases, the majority of the data they're not going to have to uh, process in your query. You're going to filter out and throw away. So you avoid reading it altogether. Um, yeah, so for example, 
Yeah, so like like for example, let, let me cook up an example here uh, off the bat. Uh, so say say for example, you have one table that has sales from uh, like worldwide sales, and then you have a report that just deals with US sales. Then when you run the query, it would not even, and it's partitioned by like country, for example, or even by states and so on, it would not even touch the, the older data that's like from other countries, right? Because it's in a different partition, it could easily ignore that and just be dealing with like where it already sort of upfront knows where the data even sits, right? Yeah, and it's, it's also very common, for example, when you have uh, event data, uh, let's say uh, you're, um, you're dumping all your website visits onto the data mm -hmm. lake. Uh, you, if you part by, uh, by date or, or some time dimension, uh, when you go on query, you're usually, I mean, you may you may keep years worth of data, and that can be can be massive. And for example, at Facebook, we used to do this a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, when you're doing analytics, you're not uh, analyzing or processing all the several years worth of data. You typically want to look at most recent data. So you put a filter that says where date greater than um, I know a week ago, for example. And then when you have partitioning, the engine can very quickly inspect all the partitions and then uh, ignore all the partitions beyond a week ago and and go on and only go and read the data for the recent partitions. Yeah, so it's it's very important. So all that gone gone a bit better now with iceberg, and that's also why people uh, migrate, obviously, right? Like they had they they want that flexibility and other advantages from a table format. Me and Dane talked about this a lot last time. Um, one thing that also happened recently is uh, we talked about a bit about this new table function called add files. And I wanted to just show you that um, in the iceberg connector, there's this new table function. That's a good example for um, expanding and moving data. So if you go to the iceberg table and there's uh, the iceberg connector add files. So there's this uh, add files from table and add files, uh, what's called a table procedure. And the way to execute a table procedure is in this case with the alter table syntax. And that's something where I wanted to just like let everyone know that like you have to pay attention to this in the docs and in general how to use this because sometimes it's a bit confusing um, and it, it makes a big difference. So in this case, it's an alter table. So you're changing something on a specific table. In this case, there's the example catalog, the lake house schema, and then there's this iceberg customer orders table. So the context is already established for this uh, table procedure. It's running in the context of this specific table. And then the table procedure is called add files from table. So it adds files from another table to this table. And then you specify what that other table is. In this case, it's another schema and another table in the same catalog for example, right? So this is all operating in the same catalog and the same uh, applies to the add files kind of thing. The reason I want to mention this is because it's different to, now let me see if I have some here. So here's another example. These are the, what's called a call. I don't know how you like distinguish that in terms of naming. Like this is what, what is a call? That's just a general procedure, right? It's not a table procedure. Or is it still yeah, a so call is a uh, is, is a callable procedures. Uh, I mean, they they, they are a, an entity that um, is described in the SQL specification. The the table procedures that you were talking about are an extension that we added in Trino. Yeah, and there's they are in the context of a table. A call kind of can be anything, right? Like we have call, uh, like we have procedures that are like this one, for example, here is a rollback to a snapshot. So this is in the context of a specific table, right? So it's like, it, but it establishes that context of the table with um, with the parameters, right? So I think we have like a like in the Hive connector, if you go. Yeah, and the, the, the main difference between those, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of an unfortunate difference, but it's, um, it's kind of an implementation constraint uh, calls the, the, the callable procedures, uh, the ones you call with call, are executing the coordinator, and they have they have no way of doing distributed parallel processing of data. So oh. they, they're typically metadata invocations, some kind of metadata manipulation or, or some simple operation like that. 
uh, the table procedures uh, execute as, uh, I mean, internally they are planned as if they were a query. So they can do a, some metadata operation, but they have the whole power of the distributed uh, parallel execution of, of, of queries. So if it needs to do a maintenance on a partition table across partitions, the different workers can do part of the work in different um, places, basically, right? So like it can benefit from that parallelization. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Alexandra is asking that we put the link into the docs in the chat. Um, obviously, trino.io slash docs, um, there's all sorts of stuff there. We will also do that in a follow-up blog post. Thank you for chiming in, Alexandra, and paying attention. Um, we'll we'll do a few more excursions to the docs maybe later. <laughs> but yeah, so pay attention to that. Those are different. Like you see here, this is a system create empty partition, for example. Well, that's not in the context of any like table. So obviously that that would be a different kind of procedure, right? So these are so pay attention to what these are and also let us know if we mess them up. Specifically, like the add files, for example, we had wrong and we just fixed it with this release, so I can show it today. <laughs> um, so that's that's about uh, dealing with change. Now, the schema hive evolution, we talked a little bit already. It's rather limited. And one of the important aspects is that the column order was fixed in the partitions and in the tables. Um, here's a bit more documentation to this. And you see here um, how Martin was er mentioning earlier, there, there is these type conversions happening is like there's quite a lot of types actually that are tr seamlessly can be converted basically right is there anything else to add about this martin uh no i, I mean i i think that that covers it um i was actually thinking about something in in iceberg that uh came up recently i i'll i'll i kind of lost my my train of thought there i'll i'll, I'll if you i remember it up. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. Well, the, these these conversions are basically also like they automatically only happen uh, for some files, right? Like I'm guessing this only works for Parquet and Oak. It won't work for other random file formats. Like the Hive Connector, for example, is so supports all, all sorts of other files. It will probably won't work for all of them, right? Right. This is this is uh, well. So so there are some. It's complicated because these so Hive supports multiple file formats, and each mm -hmm. file format has different ways of encoding the types physically. And mm -hmm. some conversions are possible, some conversions are not. Uh, but then there are some there are some rules. For example, in, in Hive, you have a schema that is associated with a partition, and you have a schema that is associated with a table. And then underneath that, you also have this, the actual data in the files, which may be different in, different physical encodings. So there's mm -hmm. like a two levels of conversion that, that conceptually have to happen. And, and the, the conversion between partition level and, and schema, uh, table schema level, they are kind of gen general and apply to everything, but the conversion between the file and the, and the uh, partition schema may vary a bit. But but yeah, in general, like those are the, the conversions. We we try to replicate the semantics of Hive. Like yeah, Hive has some rules. Like if you go and run a query in Hive, it has rules on when you're reading a file and and the table or part or partition schema says it should be read as a, a certain type. It will do the conversion for you. And in Trino, we try to mimic that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what people expect when you, they run a if they run a query in Hive and then they want to run a query in, in Trino. They want to see the same same results for the same data. Um, sometimes there are interesting choices uh, that we would not, <laughs> we would not make uh, we would not have made if if uh, we had a chance to design that from the ground up. But uh, we I mean, we try to match the behavior that exists in Hive because that's what people expect. Yeah, fair enough. All right, so let's see what we talk next about. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit more is the whole Sorry. data maintenance. Sorry, I, I, I remember what I was going to talk about. There's a, I'll go up uh, to the previous one. Yeah, on the column order, there, there's a pull request in progress. We're, we're working it out um, that will give it give users a way to add columns in um, at arbitrary places for connectors that support it. For example, you can say, let's say you have a table with columns A, B, and C, and you want to insert a, a column uh, between A and B, then you can say, 
add column uh, X after A. Uh, and we're, we're working out the syntax, but the, the idea is to be able to do those manipulations without having to rewrite the whole table. And of course, that only works for some connectors because um, uh, there are some connectors that expect the, uh, they, they don't have a, you have to have a, a machinery underneath in terms of how you represent the columns and, and the, the um, yeah, how, how you reason about the position, positions of the columns in the, in the metadata to be able to pull that off. Uh, but more, more modern connectors can support that. For example, Iceberg can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's obviously useful because um, typically there's always people that run a like select star from blah. And <laughs> then if the order of the columns is like completely useless and like makes no sense, right? Like you have first them as the first column and then last them is like 10 columns over. That's like really terrible. So the, the order of columns is, is important. And, you mentioned that Iceberg supports that. Well, it's kind of weird that you say that because I'm like, well, of course, every database supports that. <laughs> like if you do that in Postgres, you can, can insert a column anywhere, right? So um, it's one of those things where um, the dealing with the physical layout and the files and all that stuff under the hood as part of the whole stack that you're dealing with makes it complicated again, right? So but it also makes it more powerful for bigger data. So <laughs> nothing comes for free. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's also one of the examples for where, where data maintenance is important because, um, you know, um, you have to sort of understand that when you're running a lake house, you have to also take care of the files that are laying around there, right? Like Trino obviously is the query engine, but you also have to take care of the files. And um, me and Dane chatted a bit about that last time. So Compaction is all, is obviously important. Why is compaction so important, Martin? Well, so in, in Ice, especially we're talking about Iceberg here. Uh, in Iceberg, files are immutable. Once you write them, uh, you are you are done with them. You cannot append to them dynamically or uh, after the fact once they are closed. So one of the things that uh, you you may want to do, well, it's a number of things that you may want to do. But one of them is, for example, let's say you are adding data to your data lake. You are streaming from some some external data source and you want to have reasonably low latency between an event happening and an event being uh, available to query so what you're going to do is you're going to create files and very very quickly close them and, and and finish writing them so for example if you want if you want an event to not take more than say five seconds between when it happens and when you can query it you will write a file and after five seconds you close the file and then and then it's ready it's available to for an engine to, to access it. The the problem is that, well, if you do it every five seconds, then in a, in a single day, you're gonna have thousands of files. So, uh, and then after a few weeks, you may have hundreds of thousands or, or, or I mean, tens or hundreds of thousands. And having too many files means that whenever you're querying that, um, that, that whole data set, you're gonna be open, the engine has to inspect and open all those files which is very inefficient. You end up with uh, a lot of IO uh, for each file, like uh, there's latency associated with re opening and reading each file if, like in, in object storage. So what you wanna do is you wanna uh, take um, all these files and, and, and coalesce them into something bigger. So well, that, that's what compaction can do. It can take all these, uh, say, files created every five seconds or, or a small uh, period of time and then coalesce them together into a file that represents, for example, a whole day. As long as you have, you don't have too much data, if, otherwise you, you start splitting based on data sizes, but uh, you want to have the smallest number of files with a reasonable size. So it's it's uh, cheaper to query them, to, to it's cheaper to read them, open them and, and, and process them. Uh, the other thing that, uh, especially Iceberg and formats like Iceberg and Delta Lake can do if they allow uh, modifications to to rows, so you can you can have a row, you can insert a row, then you can say update the field in a row, or you can delete it. But given that the files underneath are uh, immutable, the way that works is you add another record in some other file that says, "Oh, this other row got modified. This is the new data," or "This other row got deleted." So when you're querying, you have to reconcile all those differences. And if you have a lot of changes, you end up having to potentially process for one row. You may have, you, you, you're gonna have one record for each event that happened. Every update, every deletion, 
uh, you have one one extra thing to look at, and and that that translates in cost during query time. So in order to offset that cost, what you can do is every now and then you can go and compact compact all those changes into the the the, the final image of that that specific row. So uh, and then then once you query, you're going to be reading only one 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 record and and you don't have to reconcile any changes. Mm, cool. So so uh, just a typical like a question like you were saying. Um, wow. There's all these changes coming in, and like those would all be small, small files. And I th I'm guessing anything where it's transactional, it's like in the kilobytes max files, right? Like the, to, unless you're dumping in like actual binary data, and a lot of it is like textual data, it'll be small. Uh, and mm -hmm. then you said getting to bigger files. What are we talking about here? Like it's a good file size. You like talking. Well yeah, yeah. It depends on the volume of data. Like, for example, you may have a very massive uh, data stream that writes every minute. It writes, I know, hundreds of giga of, of megabytes or gigabytes or whatever. Like, you can have that that scenario. Uh, what will what will happen there is that you will end up with a lot of files, but every file is going to be big. And then, yeah, you have to deal with querying that data uh, using more resources, more more machines, and so on. But that's just the nature of it. The problem is when you have, when you are artificially uh, splitting the files based on time boundaries, uh, when you actually don't have much data. Let's say you are adding one row per minute mm -hmm. and you are closing files. Uh, let's say you're closing files every minute. So you're going to have one row per file. That's very, very inefficient. I mean, mm -hmm. Iceberg and Parquet are not designed for that. Um, uh, so, so what you want to do is have all those rows uh, in in a single file, and normally, like, I mean, this this is um, it, the answer is it depends. It generally depends, but uh, what we've seen is good sizes are in the in for so a parquet file uh, has inside it uh, what's called row groups. So it's like a independent chunks of of data. So a file can be massive if you it doesn't matter, but a row group uh, is good when it's uh, somewhere around you know, 100 megabytes or so, because that's that's a good chunk of, of data that's going to be uh, something you can process in one machine in a reasonable amount of time. That's going to be the unit of processing in within mm -hmm. three. So you don't want to be too small. You don't want to be too large because then you're you're going to increase your latency, your minimum latency for processing. But uh, that that's that's kind of a good good rule of thumb, like try to shoot for row groups that are about 100 megabytes. I mean, your files can be bigger and contain multiple row groups, but. Um, yeah. I, I would guess that in a typical use case, that means that the average files will all be too small because like producing 100 megabyte of data, unless you're doing like video or audio or something like that, like that's a lot of text. Like you can write a couple of books in the time. Like, it's, uh, like, like as you know, from writing to the definitive guide, it takes a long time to write a long book. So. Um, textual data, even if it's like event logs and stuff, like megabytes and megabytes of that doesn't come that easy, right? So, right. yeah, and, and, and again, if if your data is not very big and you I mean, you don't have that much data, that's fine. I mean, the engine will be able to process that. But if you have a lot of data, you don't want it to be split up in very small files because then you're going to suffer uh, in performance. So. Are you going to? Yeah, you're not going to get the performance you could get if you had bigger files. Cool. All right, so that's compaction. And then the other aspect is you were saying there's all these changes, like with deletions and stuff. What what Iceberg and other systems then do is they create what's called a snapshot, which is kind of like a like a in in Git terms, I would say it's like a commit, like a point in time that captures a specific status of everything. Um, and if you do a lot of those, that also can make the query slow, right? Yeah. So, so in in Iceberg, every change creates a snapshot, and basically, a snapshot is a uh, you can think of it as you have your entire state of your table, and you make a you add a new record, so it creates a new file. What it does is it creates a new snapshot that points to all the previous files plus the new file, and then when you read the table, it knows how to how to know wh what the current state of the table is. And then it keeps all these snapshots uh, like for historical reasons. You, you, you may be able to want to, you may want to be able to go 
back in time and, and inspect what the state of the database was at a given point in time. So you can go and look at the snapshot that represented the state at, at that time and, and identify the files. And then effectively you run a, we actually support this in Trino. You can do what we call a time travel query. Um, but then at some point, like if you, you may delete data and, and those snapshots are still, there are old snapshots pointing to files that are no longer used and especially after compactions and you want to uh, reclaim that space so you need to go and, and, and remove those snapshots yeah and I, obviously there's also like like procedures around for that in trino um next thing i wanted to talk about is a little bit uh, like the common thing we talked about this last time um hive supported formats like json and and like less uh, text and so on that are less less uh, compact than the column formats in use now also uh, parquet and org um, is there anything else that um, apart from changing to these formats that you think is important when you keep in mind to do those file format changes because typically you have to actually like basically write the data into a new table to get those file format changes done right uh, it depends. So in Iceberg, the the file the format is is uh, uh, parquet. So mm -hmm. I mean, when, when there's no change in format. So if you're if you're migrating from a different uh, table format like um, I don't know Delta Lake or Hive and into parquet, then you're going to be writing a new table that is mm -hmm. going to be uh, Iceberg and parquet format. Uh, in Hive, Hive actually supports mix formats across partitions. For example, you can, you can have a table that has multiple partitions and some partitions are in CSV, some other partitions are in, in Parquet, some other partitions like, I, sure. you can have a, a mix like that. It's not very common, but I, I mean, I, we've seen it happen. Like I, I think when we're at Facebook, there were some, some tables that were uh, created like that because you end up with the, what happened was, Newer partitions got created in some cheap to create format or, or to stream into. So you end up with maybe text or CSV. And then there's a background process that goes and converts them into something more optimized, like ORC or, or well, that's what we use at, at Facebook. But so you could have that, that mix and it's a way to evolve your, your, um, your table from one format to another kind of dynamic we are having to rewrite the whole thing but that's that's in hive i parquet mm -hmm. like it's only one for one file format so it doesn't matter okay cool fair enough so so the last thing i want to talk about is a bit sort of outside of the realm of like just maintaining uh the system and that's like um compaction goes a little bit then uh snapshot removal definitely goes a little bit but but there's even more so so what do you do when you feel like data is getting too much right obviously it's if like if it's partitioned then that's fine but maybe you don't want historical data anymore like what are your what what are the, some of the things you can do in terms of like actually removing data or also is there strategies where you know like you have really fast s3 storage and then you want to migrate to like something like a little bit slower or so what are some of the things you've seen there that are like useful or would you just stick on the same place and and just like call it a day? yeah i mean partition is critical here um especially for example if you have time-based data you need to partition by time or some time dimension so that you can remove all data without having to rewrite everything um if your table is not partitioned then potentially let's say you want you have a table that has a, a year's worth of data you want to keep a year's worth of data Mm -hmm. And if your table is not partitioned, then all the records are going to be intermixed, uh, potentially intermixed. So if you want to delete data beyond that year, you will have to go and rewrite all the files that contain a single, uh, for every every file that contains at least one record that is older than that uh, threshold you want to remove um, uh, for, you will need to rewrite that file. So that could be super expensive. So the typical thing to do here is you partition by some time-based dimension and then deleting all data is just a matter of dropping partitions. That's mm -hmm. very, very common. Um, I mean, it works, works well for time-based uh, data. Uh, for anything else, like if, you're, if you have uh, dimensional data that is changing frequently and you're adding and, dele and, and deleting 
uh, records, then you have to do compactions and, and snapshot removals because that's what's going to happen. You're going to end up with uh, files that record the deletions, as I mentioned before, and then you're going to do compaction that's going to create new snapshots, and then the old snapshots are going to refer to the old files, and you have to prune those snapshots to reclaim that space. I guess that's also one of the reasons why um, these typical demands now legally to be able to delete privacy related data upon request and stuff that are very difficult in the end because like you're talking about deleting some specific records for like say one person or so or one account associated to it and then you get all these headaches coming in with it right yeah i mean there, there's there's interpretations of of those uh, regulations and <laughs> i mean the different organizations can i mean interpret different ways like in in most cases i mean I, i've seen some cases what matters is that you uh, the data is not accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. You cannot query it. You cannot read it through the normal uh, uh, procedures. But it doesn't mean that every single byte has to be removed. As, as long as within a certain time frame, the the, the data is is gone. So you have some leeway there. But I mean, I'm not not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, I'm not going to... Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, but like obviously that makes sense, right? Like say like that's one of the advantages, I guess, in terms of like um, these uh, more f modern lake house formats where there is a separation between the metadata and the actual data. Once the metadata is updated and the record is deleted, it's basically gone. There's no way you can find it, right? Right, right. And it's, it's technically only a soft delete, but like, well, <laughs> if there's no way to get to it otherwise, then that's kind of like the same. Fair enough, that's cool. So yeah, there's always more on this data maintenance. Um, one of the things that's also interesting is, obviously with data changing, um, you often end up with just adding more data to a table and doing those changes. And now I just wanted to point out again that the merge statement in Trino is well supported, specifically in the object storage connectors. It's not supported in all the, object, in all the connectors. We are working towards getting that into the JDBC connectors, which will be super cool. But it is basically a statement that allows you to, within one statement, do things like inserting, updating, and deleting records. And that's very useful for like ingesting data. If you're really stuck, you can also emulate that with multiple statements, but um, merge is pretty powerful. So we have this covered in another uh, training. We did this, so this can look something like that, where you go merge into some orders table, for example, here. And then when you go, when there's a match on the order status, one thing you do, like in this case, a delete statement, otherwise you do some other operation. That's kind of what this roughly looks like. Can be very helpful and uh, useful to, to get a handle of and like know how this works. Uh, so have you seen much usage of the merge statement there? Or, and what are some of the like, limitations you can find out? Like one of the limitations I found is that it's not just random, like the, the statement from where you're coming from, like in terms of the, what you're querying and what you're inserting to has to be closely related. You can't just like go state from some random table into some other random table. Um, I mean, you, you, so yeah, there's some, some limit implementation limitations like that, but no, I mean, in, in general, like merge is a generalization of update, lead and, and insert. It's just yeah. a, you can think of it as, um a syntactic sugar for doing all those things or actually you can think of insert update and delete as syntactic, syntactic sugar for uh, special versions of merge um yeah no it, it, it is very powerful uh it's not it's not something that most people know about especially people coming from OLTP databases they don't run into mm -hmm. that but it's a lot more common in data warehouses yeah. Uh, well, you have you have a just say you have a, your master table and then every day you are uh, you have a table with some some kind of change that you need to reconcile and, and incorporate. So merge is a is, is a, a pretty powerful way to do that. Yeah, you were just you were just mentioning the 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 like term master table. Do you want to expand it a little bit in the sense like that's like. I'm guessing this is like a, like a transactional system inserts the data into that master table, and then you have a bunch of downstream tables that are used for analytics and whatever, and you need to get that data moved around, right? 
Well, the, the, the case I was thinking was more, you have your, uh, your say you have a data warehouse with a table that represents the current view of customers or as of mm -hmm. last day. And, and then every day or every night you have a process that takes all the changes that happened to your customers in the, in the last day in your OLTP system. And then you want to fold them into your, uh, your, um, the table you have your, in your data warehouse. So, and that folding means you want to delete all the customers that, that were dropped. You want to update the ones that had some data. Uh, about them change and you want to insert all the new customers well with merge mm -hmm. you can do that in one shot yeah so definitely worth looking at and uh, i'm looking forward to get this for the other connectors by the way <laughs> um sounds good uh, so let's talk about something else um a bit more down to the middle in terms of um sql queries uh and that is a bit about structural data types so um, now what we always talked about is we talked about tables, right? So there is like a table, it has about like a table sit or sits in a schema, sits in a catalog, and the table has columns with data types and rows. Well, structural data types are kind of like one level below where like that kind of like hierarchy or a setup is in one column, like in one value, right? A typical example is JSON, right? Like where like a whole JSON document is in one column, like it's just one text blurb string. But Trino also supports map, array, and row. And so that's worth talking about, right? Yeah, and, and, and so one, I mean, I, kind of a mental model for this is, uh, you could think of a table as a collection of rows, right? Mm -hmm. And each row has uh, has fields. I mean, they happen to be the, the columns of, of, the, of the table, but then, a, a value can also be a row, so you can have arbitrary nesting. Uh, so you have a, um, a column, ha is of, if, if a column is of type row, it means it has, um, it represents a structure that has, has its own set of columns. And then each of those columns can be in, in, in turn a, a row type, which means you can have nested columns and so on. Um, All right, let's, so, let's, let's look a bit at, the, at that a little bit more. So I, I think I have some cool stuff about this. So Jason, obviously, right, like everyone uh, knows that we talked about this quite a bit in a, in a recent class as well. Um, is a very common format, comes out of the REST APIs, logging <laughs> and all these contexts. Those are the typical contexts like the no SQL databases where they just dumped a bunch of SQL, uh, like JSON files into tables. Trino has very rich support for that. And we discussed this in detail in a recent training. So for those of you that look at the slide deck later today, um, we have this whole section here on JSON with like the main JSON function, JSON exists, it's query and all this stuff. So there's, there's a lot to it. So we're not gonna dive into that, but I did want to dive into one thing today. And that is we have this new format, a uh, new support that's not yet well documented, we'll document it uh, shortly, but um, that's a JSON table. So what, what's different about JSON table to others is that it doesn't return just a field or a value, it returns a full table structure from an input JSON. And it's actually part of the SQL standard, probably came in a couple of years ago now, Martin? Yeah, yeah, we had a couple of years. Well, the, in, the, in the standard showed up, uh, I think it was, 2016, if I recall, mm -hmm. uh, but we added it a couple of years ago in, in Trino. Uh, yeah, so so like just to get an idea of what this looks like, so here is here's a very simple example query. Um, this is um, super powerful actually, but if you run this query, like see, this would be the JSON table statement. And we're just gonna, in this example, just return everything. And this is the example JSON document. So there's a JSON document here that has these ID name and Wikidata ID and other like values, like key value pairs basically in a JSON format. And with this pretty powerful syntax here, you can basically say, return this to me as a table with these columns and so on. So if I run this query and you know, this looks overwhelming, Oops, Daisy, what did I just do? Hang on. I wanted to copy this. No? All right, this is not working as I want it to work. Hmm. 
And I have my local Trino instance running here. So if I run this query here, oh no, it copied too much. Copy. Ah, uh, what's it doing? Sorry. Oh, there. No, that. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I copied too much text, but essentially here you see the query running and it returns a nice table as a statement. So what's the what's some of the use cases of this, Martin, when you when you didn't actually like have this like you extract table out of like a, an actual table in your SQL statement there? In this case, we just have it nicely represented so you can then visualize it and display it in your BI tools and so on. But can you also do other usages of that, like then actually join it over or something like that with another statement? Um, I mean, of course, like this, this is so JSON table is a table function and it, it, you can use it anywhere a table, normal table can be used. So, so you can do select from that JSON table and then you can join against something else. And what you're doing is you are, you're telling the system, uh, process that JSON data, extract it as a, some kind of table structure that has these columns and then join it against something else uh, in the same way you would join two tables, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think one of the important things uh, about JSON table is that, or one of the benefits of JSON table. So I've seen many cases where, just say you have um, you have JSON that has a bunch of very deeply nested data, and you want to extract uh, some element from uh, deep inside the JSON structure and and split it out into separate columns. What you end up having to do otherwise is you have to parse and process the JSON multiple times because you want you need to say, for example, I want to get the ID. So therefore, you have, have to evaluate this path and, and fetch the ID and put it in this column. And then you have to evaluate it again in, in a different expression to pull out a different column and evaluate it again and so on. Uh, so that's, that can be expensive depending on the on the mm. shape of the JSON path and the, and the structure of the JSON document. So with JSON table, you can factor out all those things. So, uh, I mean, this is not, it's not very clear in this example, but you can say uh, something like fetch something from deep, uh, deep in this JSON structure, and then the result, just take a couple of values and put in separate columns. So you only process that expression once. So from a performance perspective, it's, it, it, it's, it's a win. I guess uh, it's I'll, also easier to write, right? Like ultimately, like, yeah, it's easy to provide because you you don't end up repeating the same expression with small variations in many places. So it's easier mm -hmm. to write, it's easier to understand what the query is doing, and so on. Yeah, so that's that's really cool. So JSON is always worth looking at. It's everywhere, and like luckily Trino has a lot of tools to write uh, to look at that. So also look at the old recording. I'll add that into the links of our recap. And, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I was going to say one more thing, and, and you, you don't show in this example, and this kind of gets into the more advanced usages. There's a uh, there are some things you can do that uh, with JSON table that you can't easily do otherwise. Like for example, if you have a JSON object that has two arrays, and you want to say the cross join of the values of the two arrays. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can do that within that JSON table invocation. There's some syntax for that. Uh, that gets otherwise very complicated if you if you wanted to do it in, in plain SQL. So yeah, you can, uh, yeah, yeah. No, that that's awesome. Uh, good to know. Uh, me and Michael are working on the documentation for that. So hopefully we'll <laughs> ship that soon. And and for those of you that that uh, want to play with this now, um, you might have to look at a JSON table documentation for other databases and try it in Zeno. <laughs> Unfortunately, but we'll we'll uh, share these examples at least and, and more to come soon. Um, the other straight uh, structural data types that I wanted to talk about are uh, array, map, and row. You already mentioned a little bit that um, row is kind of like a row in a database, basically. So it's basically a bunch of values of different data types. Um, array is a list of values of the same type, so a list of numbers or a list of strings or whatever, and then a map is a list of key value pairs. Um, the cool stuff is um, they often map out of the database, right? So there's like 
underlying databases also support these systems, right? Like, um, 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 like, do you have an example? Like, I don't know, like, I guess like Iceberg potentially even support some of these. I know that like Oracle also support these kind of types as well. Yeah, all the SQL data support is some variant of, of this. Uh, I mean, th these are these types are also like if you if you if you if you're a programmer, like these are similar to uh, what's available in many languages. Uh, row is like I know like a tuple type or a structure type in, in in many other languages. Map is just maps. Arrays is like well, they're probably the most common one. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple couple things to to uh, recall though is the uh, row type has a fixed number of of uh, fields of um, as Manfred said, different potentially different types. An array is doesn't have the number of elements uh, defined up front. So you can have, if you have an array, you can have an array with one or with five elements in 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 the same column. So yeah. So here here's a little example query, right? Like if I run like this is the using the array constructor. If you don't get it out of a database, then you can like literally in your example query just build an array like that. And then you can access the elements of an array with this like what's called subscript operator. So you can go array and then that bracket and then two, for example, and I would get 1.2 out, right? So you can access the elements of an array. Like Martino also mentioned, arrays can be made bigger, like the dynamics. So you can concatenate multiple arrays together. And the amazing thing is actually there's a lot of functions that you can do. Like if you look at the array functions documentation, like all these functions are available to work and that's like will feel very familiar to people that that do like programming with other programming languages there's there's a lot of power in in like you know like transforming arrays trimming them and like checking for if something is in an array and so on so it's very powerful to like it feels a bit like doing like i don't want to say procedural but kind of procedural programming in sql you can kind of do these things with it in, in the array structures do you have any examples where like these arrays come up in purple, like in, in like an example, like where their systems are using them in databases? Um, Do you remember? I'm trying to remember a concrete example, but um, I mean, no, no, at the top of my head, but I mean, it's, it's very, uh, it's very common. Like, it, well, if you have JSON data, you're going to end up with arrays at some point, and then mm -hmm. you can, like, if you want to map those to tables, the natural transformation is to map those fields as arrays. Uh, uh, yeah, so have... like Robert is just mentioning that Pino supports arrays. They're called multi-value types. It's definitely a, an example. Like, a, a, one example I can think of in the past is like when you have a web application and you write an input for like a selection of like a, a multi-select thingy, and then the selection, the multi-select, gets just dumped into one field, and it's like well, this person selected choices one, five, seven, and 11, then that's an array that gets dumped in that one field and that comes over to your system and you're like, well, how do I like make, like unfurl this or like process this? Well, the array functions can do that. And that's, I think, really cool. So that's arrays. Um, maps are very similar, just key value pairs. So very similar when you construct a map, you are constructing it by two, arrays one of the arrays the array of keys and then the other one is the array of values and obviously the order here is, is important and then you can do the same thing right like you can do the subscript operator to access the elements and then again if you look at the functions documentation here there is a lot of not as many as for for arrays obviously but um there's still like you can filter them you can find out which like you find can find entries and stuff like that so um it's pretty cool uh to use this functionality one thing i was going to say so that that constructor is is actually a, almost a, a historical artifact <laughs> uh, i mean why it ended up that way uh in the future we might uh change it or a, a, a different variant we, we've been talking about that for years because uh, the, the problem is like you have two arrays there they have to match the sizes if they don't match you can't mm -hmm. tell ahead of time it's only like when you execute the query that it fail it fails so um uh, like we we've been thinking about uh, something more more that that can more naturally represent the construction of an array based on entries of key value pairs 
And there's actually a, a function for that, which is what I would suggest if people are creating a race, that's more, more natural. If you go to the docs, it's called map from entries. And oh, we so may at some point have uh, dedicated syntax for that. Like the map entries, this one? Oh, from, from entries. entries. Yeah, yeah. So where you say, instead of giving the two separate arrays, you give it an oh, array yeah. of entries, right? So it's an array of key value pairs. Uh, that's a more natural way of representing uh, uh, the construction, but it's, it's a bit more verbose, of course, with the map from entries versus just the map keyword. Yeah, fair enough. But like, I mean, this definitely makes sense because this is the first key value pair, and right. then this exactly. is the second yeah. pair, right? So it's it's more like, say, you would uh, build up an array from like a properties file or whatever, then you have the line, each line is a key and a value and stuff like that. So that's... <laughs> follows that logic that's cool all right so that's the last ones are rows um rows i have a question martin so row like as, as you see here this is kind of like the explicit syntax where you have a row defined here in this case this is an a, a integer number a double number and then a string mm -hmm. and then we define it like we sort of like give it field names for this query um is this kind of like the same as when a row comes out of the table and you write a query and then you get one row? Is this kind of the same construct? It's the same construct, yeah. Uh, so what you're doing there is the the row, the one that says one, two, zero, and foo. Uh, that's a row with anonymous fields. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in standard SQL, rows are supposed to have names. So fields are supposed to have names every time. And, and the, the specification says the implementation should pick a name for you. Uh, so we, we, we went a little different direction there. And we said, well, since we cannot pick a name that, that, that is, uh, that, there's no name that would be reasonable to, to pick. We said, we allow rows with uh, fields that have no name. So you, you have the positions and the types for each of the fields, but no names. So what you're doing there is you're constructing a row that has three fields of their whatever types they are with no names. Uh, if you wanted to reference the fields out of that row, you have to do it by position and there's a syntax for that. And then what you're doing is you're casting it to a different row type that um, uh, happens to give it give the fields names. So then you can you can refer to them by name as well. Sorry, that was weird. Uh, my camera ran out of ca out of battery, so I'm I'm on a different camera now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's interesting. So, um, so when you have a row like that, and it's like constructed, can you like theoretically in some SQL statement then also build up a an actual table? Uh, there's no direct. I mean, concept. I, I, I guess under the covers, yeah, that's sort of what's happening. Uh, there's no simple way. To, actually, there's one way to explode that row into fields because you can mm -hmm. say, uh, uh, for example, you can say, uh, say you have a subquery that has a select row mm -hmm. um, from uh, uh, say it's a values row or something like that. Then you, you can do select that row type dot star, and then that will explode it into separate the separate fields. Oh yeah, okay. So it's kind of a way to go from that row into into an exploded table. So cool. All right. So that's that's our structural data types. Now let me just try. And... So. <laughs> We won't have time to talk about analytics of multiple rows, window functions, and match recognize. Seems like our general thing that happens. Um, I think we want to do a quick one because that's a smaller topic, and that's just quickly talking about views a little bit. Um, going to take us a few minutes only. So there's cool. other material about that. Um, so I want to quickly like, discuss this a little bit because um, there's a lot to it. and it seems to be causing confusion all the time. So what is a view? A view is like a select query with a name, sort of like a, a virtual table basically, right? Um, so it exposes the results of that query like a table. 
And what this allows you to do is you can hide all the complexities on how you created that data from someone else. So say so if you like a business analyst or so that like knows the schema of a database very, very well and like knows like all these JSON functions and row and array and like how to parse it all out, then you can write a view that does all that complex stuff and then someone that is just a newbie uh, can just like point at a at the view and see nice columns, right? And that's obviously super helpful uh, for for users to potentially make it easier for other users, right? You can give them nice column names and so on. Um, what's important for a view is that it runs the underlying query all the time. So the data, whenever the query is run, is up to date and correct. Uh, what's something that I learned recently, however, is um, the semantics of a view are tied to the semantics of the underlying system, like the underlying tables and stuff. So um, when you change an underlying table, like it has a different, like say a data type changes or so, even though your query, like your view might have something like select star from blah and then some conditions, um, the view will be invalidated, right? So it's literally like a table with special types and so on. Um, and so that's it's very useful for for users to have. Yeah. So so a couple of comments. So so there's actually one one very um, it's actually a very common use use for views, which is uh, if you want to uh, control access to let's say you have a table has uh, data for I know about all your customers and and you want to you want to give access to only certain people to a subset of the customers like yeah, i remember uh, uh at a company we had data had uh sorry table had data for a bunch of our customers and we have the sales sales people that were um, in charge of different accounts we want to give them access to a slice of that data but not to data about every customer because they would misbehave and end up using data from competitors for one customer to sell to the other customers, which is a big no-no. So, <laughs> so, so what we wanted to, to do was, okay, how do we restrict that? And while well, you had your table with, um, with all your customer data, you restrict that to only some, some role or some person can see the contents of that table. And then what you do is you create views that restrict and say, for example, uh, this is the view that's, that selects all the customers for account A. And then um, these are, sorry, for account uh, owner A. And another view that says these are all the customers for account owner B. And then the account owner A can only query that, that first view, account owner B can query the second view. And then the view can access the underlying table, but then the account owners cannot access the underlying table directly. So it's a way to kind of partition your your security. Uh, it's one of the the, the the powers of views because they execute the, the view executes the underlying query for the view uh -huh. with the permissions of the person that created the view effectively. Huh. Right. Yeah, so so, the, so that, that that gets us into a very interesting aspect of the views. That is what causes the confusion, and that is a view runs the query each time, and that gets us to the different types of views. Because what we were talking about now are basically Trino views. So that's a view that's defined by Trino, uses the Trino SQL dialect, and is typically stored in a meta store. So it has to be stored somewhere, and Typically, the connectors that support view creation and stuff are the Lakehouse connectors, so Hive, Delta Lake, Iceberg, and Hoodie. And uh, so that's where a Trino view is stored. That's completely different from, like, say, a PostgreSQL view. Like, a PostgreSQL view is defined in the PostgreSQL database. In Trino, it just shows up as a table. Like, the whole uh, idea that um, Trino knows how to do a Postgres view in terms of like running the PostgreSQL query. That's not possible, right? Like it's a completely different dialect. And that also shows up prominently when it comes to Hive views. So Hive has a separate view and the Hive view might be stored in the same meta store, 
like a Hive meta store if like Twino is in use. But if it's written in HiveQL, which is kind of not SQL, it's kind of like a different dialect, then then it is not the same thing as a as a Trino view, right? And that's yeah. important to understand because even though we have a mechanism to look at them and sort of interpret them, and it can work, but like it's not the same thing as a Trino view. Well, there are a couple of differences. Uh, so when we're talking about views in database, there, there's like Postgres, uh, MySQL, Oracle, etc. Those, I mean, they are views within those systems, but from the API data access perspective, they're just table. So don't you shouldn't think of think of them as views from the point of view of Trino. It's like yeah. Trino is just querying a table. Uh, that those engines that have a query engine uh, uh, have the query engine capabilities themselves, they can do all the process to present the contents of, of those views as a table. With uh, high views, there's a bit of a difference because Hive is, uh, Hive is a, a combination of things. It's the metadata, is the table formats, is the query engine, Hive query engine. So when you have a, 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 a Hive view using Hive syntax, from Trino's perspective, all we have is a definition. We don't have access to an engine that we can say, hey, run this view and give me the table, the data as a table in the same way that uh, we do with Postgres or, or MySQL. So Trino has to run, if you want to be able to uh, um, get the data as defined in the view, you will need to be able to run that view and understand the syntax of Hive, which uh, we actually, there's actually a support for that in Trino. There's a translation layer that can understand Hive views and it can execute them uh, within the Trino query engine using uh, Trino uh, primitives and so on. It has some limitations because not everything that you can do in Hive can be done in, in Trino, uh, especially when you're dealing with functions and Hive specific functions and so on. But um, all the common types of views, Trino can interpret. Uh, all the common Hive views, Trino can interpret. Yeah. The opposite is not true though. So if Trino, if you create a view, from Trino, it will have SQL syntax from Trino, uh, unless other engines understand, uh, know how to uh, how to read, parse, analyze, and process that SQL, they won't be able to execute uh, those views to be able to get the data uh, as defined by the view. Yeah, that's also what I wanted to also explain because that often comes up now with what people call the iceberg views, which our views that are like available in the iceberg kind of collect an ecosystem and in the meta store but they are still <laughs> not independent right so they still have a different dialect so if you create a what's called an iceberg view with spark then it'll gonna be using spark sql and that's not gonna be interpretable by any other system right and the same like just like a trino view is not going to be interpretable by that so the idea that a view is cross engine transparent workable that's not the case so just be very careful when you work with views and understand those things they're very powerful but you need to understand what you're trying to achieve with them because like some use cases are obviously not possible because of those restrictions and then of course the 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 extension of that is materialized views. We're not going to talk about that that's basically a view that has the data stored there's a whole bunch of aspects that come into play and I make that more complicated because well then the data has to be stored it has to be refreshed when it's stored it kind of is potentially stale and a whole bunch of more stuff but I think Martin we've been talking for an hour um, mm -hmm. we had a couple of questions and it's been super interesting so thank you for joining me um, as usual we will make this video available we'll make the slides available um, and I hope we'll see many of you at Trino Summit in two weeks. Please register if you haven't already and stay tuned for a blog post that announces the agenda. Um, if you're sneaking over to the Starburst website, you can already see it, but I'm going to put a blog post on the Trino website with more details. So super excited. Um, and we hope to see the two of us. Uh, you'll join us to uh, be there in the keynote for Trino Summit, uh, talk about what's new and latest and greatest in Trino. And then of course, a lot of other news from other Trino users and contributors. So should be good and exciting.